see my co-authors here. A lot of them helped me with data analysis and my key co-authors, my supervisors, you know, LiPo. Um, so moving right in, we'll be talking about, so I want to talk about um, international environmental cooperation and its challenges. And so traditional explanations for such failures are often explained as problems of collective action and disparate interests, but I question this. Um, so there's literature from climate governance that argue that these claims have a weak empirical support and that the role of narratives is important to investigate. Um, circular economy is an interesting example to look at because it's a prominent but contested international narrative on socio-environmental change. On the one hand, you have proponents who see circular economy as a paradigm shift away from the linear economy towards closed loop systems, sustainable production and consumption. Then on the other hand, you have critics who argue that circular economy actually prevents radical systemic change. It perpetuates practices from ecological modernization, you know, talking a lot about decoupling. Um, but what is uncontested is that circular economy brings diverse actors together. An EU circular economy agreement, the first of its kind, um, supports the proponent's argument that it is a concept that unites interests and enables global efforts. At the same time, circular economy literature also shows that there's little international standardization on what a circular economy includes or how it's defined, and not even or especially not between front runners such as China and the EU. So given these diverging expectations and assessments, um, we investigate the circular economy cooperation through a discursive lens to understand the politics shaping its potentials and limitations. And we take macro circular economy scholarship beyond single region studies and comparisons into the realm of international relations. So we ask, how do circular economy narratives manifest in China-EU relations? And what are the implications for global environmental governance? Um, so I use Heyer's argumentative discourse analysis. It has a constructivist ontology, meaning that discursive interaction constructs social reality. There's multiple realities. But what does this mean for the results? It means that these are narratives that stakeholders subscribe to, and this is a social reality for them. So it may not reflect, for example, the reality shown by scholars studying China-EU relations through statistical analysis, for example. So I focus on two concepts from higher narratives and discourse coalitions. We'll see more of that in the results. Um, my methods were primarily expert interviews, document analysis, and participant observation. These were uh, the data was collected between 2017 and 2019. So coming to the first research question, how do these narratives manifest in China-EU relations? So first we have the optimist win-win narratives, which portray circular economy as a trade cooperation. Um, we have three reinforcing and non-exclusive uh, narratives, a common circular economy market, CE tech exchange, and regulatory harmonization for a CE. And we also have the skeptical narratives, which presents more the barriers for circular economy cooperation. So here we see identity disparity, negative competition, and distrust. So to go into a bit more detail, I uh, will show the um, uh, one example from the optimist nar narrative and one from the skeptical. So here with the common circular economy market, um, we got the EU and China both with some money problems. The EU lacks long-term investments for its circular economy transition because investors don't have sufficient incentives um, to invest and they lack economies of scale to guarantee returns. China, on the other hand, has difficulties making circular economy environmentally friendly and profitable as China's economic development requires a lot of financing, especially the upgrading of its industrial infrastructure and processes. So then the consequence of that is that the EU is losing competitiveness and suffers from a lack of growth and jobs. China lacks control over pollution from industrialization, which hampers its economic growth. And the solution presented in this narrative is that um, that EU and Chinese businesses should cooperate and compete at the same time to create a large common sea market for circular products and services in China, the EU, but also globally. The benefits of such would be that the EU regains competitiveness and jobs lost during the financial crisis, 
while creating this sustainable future. China gets to speed up its transition from state-led to market-oriented environmental initiatives, overcome economic bottlenecks uh, created by the environmental degradation. So everybody wins. Um, then coming to the second example from the skeptical narratives. So I'm going to show you how this identity disparity narrative, uh, narrative plays out. So here, and just so you know, you have five minutes left. You have halfway through. Thank you. Great. So, so the problem here is presented as that the EU and China are at different development stages and also have different governance and economic systems caused by different historical pathways, as well as different supra national and national conditions. Um, the consequence of this is that they get different conceptualizations of circular economy, and there's difficulties to apply circular economy technologies and standards with the same results, and there's difficulties for mutual learnings. Now, the solutions presented in this narrative, um, other than suggesting more cultural exchange, the solutions are rather underdeveloped and often fall back to uh, suggestions proposed by the optimist narratives. So now I'll come to this discourse, discourse coalition, which I argue um, is fragile. So I'll explain why. So here we see two coalitions, one, the market optimists, and two, the market skeptics. So currently, we can see that the optimists kind of trump skeptics. Um, but I argue this relationship can change quickly because the optimists are a fragile coalition. Um, and their cohesion depends on the circular economy's ability to deliver on the hopes of reviving China-EU trade relations and making both sides profit. So actually, you can see that identity disparity um, narrative is almost as strong as one of the um, narratives from the optimist side. Um, so just moving forward a bit quickly, we can dis discuss some of those in more detail if, if um, questions arise. But so coming to the second research question, like what are the implications of these narratives for global environmental governance? So um, I, I find them to be not very promising as in the dominant depoliticized CE narratives, they kind of provide a short-term boost for the relations, but will unlikely lead to the paradigm shift that CE proponents um, envision. So we, we just saw how you know the optimist narratives kind of perpetuate more or less this eco-modernist and global trade discourse, and they're countered by some skeptical views showing bilateral tensions. Um, then the dynamics between the narratives demonstrate this depoliticization, um, which is really strong in these narratives, and but it's a weak strategy because it enables it enables cooperation at the expense of um, addressing tensions of identity, trust, and negative competition. Um, third, the dominance of this um, discourse coalition of the optimist one is, is fragile, and it would disintegrate if trade objectives were not met, and say, if trade was affected by external forces, such as a global pandemic, for example. Um, and this discourse coalition further constructs an international circular economy through trade, which actually obscures other ways that national, regional, and local circular economy could interact. Um, so now I come to the conclusion where I try to integrate uh, with the questions that the forum posed. So, um, so which elements and interdependencies are neglected in global cooperation? Um, so I would argue that this neglect is kind of caused by this depoliticization strategy. Um, and that, and what's neglected is these issues of identity disparity, this, the different stages of development and different governance, governance models. And it, I mean, but the problems are ignored, they don't disappear. And then this kind of depoliticization also kind of disables trust building and mutual understanding because it pretends everything is fine. So we don't need to build more trust. It also neglects non-market forms of exchange, which the skeptical narratives hinted at as being important. And all of this also means that the discussions around very practical things like scales of impl implementation for circular solutions is simply not had. And what I think is politically necessary for a systemic transformation is to build international relation, uh, cooperation sorry, um, that prioritize the uh, key issue at hand, the environment, which circular economy claims to address, um, and of course, they should be linked to issues like trade because it's 
super important in the international realm, but to have it be dependent on trade relationships, um, I, I argue or my results show that this does not really, is not conducive to cooperation for circular economy or any other environmental paradigm. So that's it for me and thank you very much. And also I look forward to the discussion and please reach out afterwards if you have any questions or want to read the full paper. Thank you. So hello everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today. My name is Natasha Klein. I am a PhD student at Nova University Lisbon. And so today I'll be presenting some of the research I've been doing with my professors on organizational change management for circular economy in the public sector. So the research topic here is circular economy implementation in organizations. And most of the existing work uh, is focusing on private companies, um, looking at how to transform business models, and when it comes to the public sector, it's been mostly um, studied at micro level from a policy perspective. Uh, but the public sector is also a major contributor in the economy as a, as a significant employer and purchaser of goods and services. And, which is, uh, and this is why it's also important to look at the public sector from that side. Uh, also, while uh, private companies Pursue, um, pursue profit, public sector organizations are quite different. They're more bureaucratic, hierarchical structures that pursue multiple political and social goals and they perform uh, different functions and tasks. And so the focus here is to look at how to transition from a status quo linear model to a circular um, state in an organization. So we got inspired by organizational change management for sustainability, which is a research field that examines how organizations manage and implement change towards sustainability. And they do so by uh, identifying factors that are influencing the change process. Um, and those factors could be uh, barriers to change, so making the change slower, or drivers, so making the change uh, accelerate. And, um, and those barriers or factors uh, tend to address those soft issues in an organization, so more the human-centered, socially-based um, issues such as values, visions, uh, culture, the learning capabilities of employment, or employees, employment, employee empowerment, but also leadership and managerial aspects. And then uh, this research field also identifies then strategies to, to address those uh, barriers and drivers. And so in, it, in our research, then um, the aim is to then to identify factors of, of change in a public sector organizational context for uh, circular or circularity and to identify as well um, what strategies are needed to address those factors. And so we did a case study of the Portuguese Central Public Administration. We interviewed 14 public employees from different ministries. So we first interviewed them asking what could be the, the circular practices that they see taking place or imagine taking place in their organization. So those um, purely circular uh, oriented towards the, the circular resource management of the resources in public organizations. But then as the focus here today, we also asked about what would be, what are the difficulties in addressing those initi initiatives and uh, what are the strategies they see um, could, uh, could be implemented to uh, make this really a transformative change a focus on cultural and social change in addition to a sort of resource-based technical change as well. And so for the key findings, so the factors that were discussed, uh, so uh, elements important to address whether they have the potential to be barriers or drivers. So the first one was organizational culture, um, where it was important to really align a culture of an organization towards circularity 
Uh, is it manageable? How does a circular organizational culture looks like? Uh, that was the questions. Um, also, the element of having a leadership commitment was really important to drive a, a transition in public sector organizations. And that uh, goes along with having the availability of financial and human uh, resources to really take on changes. Also, the um, having people inside the the organizations with the right amount of knowledge and awareness of um, circularity, the issues, the elements of organizational structure, the internal regulations were also mentioned. And finally, having the access and availability to information and data to uh, communicate on the progress and monitor it. So these were the, the factors mentioned. And so after I just so you know you have five minutes left. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So from the identification of those factors, uh, we asked about what is needed, uh, what kind of strategies do they imagine could uh, take place. So we identified sort of three categories of uh, strategies or initiatives. Some were more oriented towards strategy and management, some more towards human resource management and some uh, related to communication and assessment. So to give some examples regarding the strategic and managerial initiatives, um, having circular uh, principles in strategic plans, policies, programs were mentioned, having basically leadership um, commitment, having also champions among employees and managers, people showing uh, showing the example of how to how to act. And then there was also some more governance based uh, strategies where it would be an idea to have a focal point person responsible to to implement, collect and report on what's going on. And then also having working groups um, to brainstorm about uh, organizational circularity issues uh, to potentially implement. So related to human resource strategies, having uh, expert people hired or people with circular skills in the, in the organization, for example, repairing skills was mentioned, of course, training the employees, uh, having instructions on how to use the products and equipment and guidelines. And also uh, it was mentioned that uh, good practice awards competition could motivate uh, the employees to um, act differently or in a more circular way. And finally, when it comes to communication and assessment, having an indicator system to measure and monitor uh, the change progress, uh, diagnostics, audits, having a stock management, uh, and then also having some stakeholder engagement practices uh, such as uh, sending out uh, questionnaires to ask for employees' feedback on what the, the organizational measures that uh, are introduced. And finally, having uh, conferences, events, and also publishing reports to kind of communi communicate, communicate uh, outside about what's been going on. Um, so yeah, so that was for some of the insight on our research. Um, we hope that our research triggers discussions and in, in initiatives centered around behavioral change, uh, the agency of employees, and around the social environments that uh, constitute organizations. And we hope that our uh, study contributes to building a circular society where organization needs to change also by redefining the employees' capabilities and actions and their relationship to resources. And to answer the two uh, reflection statements, uh, how and what do governments need to change for achieving the SDGs? So for me, I think they, first of all, they would need to set the SDGs as a priority, basically having the willingness um, and to not only look at it as a um, an issue, disconnected issue or uh, yet another issue to tackle, but really 
look at the SDGs or as as a through a lens uh, when every decision or, or procedure is made. And I think also what is important is co coordination uh, across the board. So really um, challenging those uh, hierarchical or silo structures of government um, because circularity or the SDGs, those type of issues are so transversal. And, um, and with that, we're changing the culture again, um, making the right people talk to each other, whether they are in different departments, different ministries, different organizations, and so they can openly share information, share insights, experiences, and learn from each other. And so finally, what is politically necessary? Uh, so I guess by politically, we meant maybe policies. So of course we could say that uh, change needed needs to be done on how uh, public procurement is made to really uh, create and promote innovation in, um, in companies, et cetera, having um, strong regulations, et cetera. But how do you, then I wonder, how do you make sure that the policies are enforced, are respected, are actually taking place? Uh, do you rather take, uh, in, do you rather implement initiatives or have punitive actions uh, in certain cases? Um, so having said that, I think probably the, for me, the key for public political practices are transparency and accountability. Uh, having transparent processes when it comes to decision making and policy making. Um, then keeping an eye on, um, well, looking at governments having uh, delivering public services. Please come uh, to an end, Natasha. Yes, that really um, um, addresses the well-being of uh, citizens and to lead by example. Because if you need to take decisions for or orient other sectors, you need to also make the work yourself. So that was it for me. Thank you for listening and I look forward to the discussions. to you about my research project. I'm a PhD student at the University of Technology of Troyes. And um, as uh, Natasha, I'm part of uh, this uh, big European um, project on circular economy called Cresting. And today I'm going to be presenting you this uh, proposition of developing uh, a territorial approach for product service systems for the circular society. And to start with, I want to um, explain two main concepts. So what are product service systems? Is the slide changing? I'm not sure. No. Not yet. No. It's still oh, yeah. the, uh, now it is. Now, right? Okay, so product service systems are um, offerings that aim to satisfy users' needs through the satisfaction of functions and performances instead of providing products to users. So in this uh, transformation on how to make a business, companies are switching, for example, from selling cars to providing mobility solutions or from selling um, light bulbs to lightning solutions. The second concept is the territory. So the territory it is mainly associated with this uh, geographical area that it's managed by a political authority. But in this research, the territory is more of a social construct, which is a, a physical space that it's inhabited and it's appropriated by these people living there in economic, uh, politic and cultural ways in which uh, they represent themselves uh, with uh, a particular identity and it is a product of their history. So product service systems are important for the transition towards a circular society because as uh, manufacturers are retaining the ownership of the products, they are incentivized to 
increase the resource efficiency of the products, their lifetime, and also using less products to provide the performance that they are aiming. And in a broader scale, the product service systems are also potentially delivering social well-being and economic prosperity to our societies. So some of the challenges in the design and implementation of sustainable service systems is like how companies or organizations can adopt this systemic approach where they need to attain a significant range of environmental, social, and economic performances for multiple stakeholders. So this becomes a challenge because especially the environmental and the social performances are really linked to the contextual conditions of the spaces where they are implemented. So currently there is a lack of tools and methods that allow companies and organizations implementing uh, a PSS to understand what is this, what are these uh, concepts, territories where the um, innovations are going to be implemented and how can they create sustainable value. So the question that we're going to be answering in this uh, presentation is how can PSS providers integrate and build collaborative territorial networks and generate sustainable value? And uh, to answer these questions, we uh, have developed a descriptive framework for sustainability researchers and managers. Uh, through the use of uh, the DRM methodology, this presentation is only showing like the two main phases, uh, which in the first one, we did the literature review with an interdisciplinary scope uh, using literature from management, geography, um, social and system innovation sciences to develop a first framework. And then we have we find a framework with two comprehensive case studies. So this is how the framework looks. I'm going to go, I'm gonna go uh, very quickly through the main components. We see that in the framework, we have uh, two main uh, processes. Like the first one is the creation of these uh, PSS network. And the second one is the, the activities uh, that are creating value for the different um, actors in the network, but also for the territories where they reside. And uh, this network formation and the activities, it's led by a vision of the PSS and also how uh, the vision of the territory. So this is an important element that um, we need to start uh, linking it is that a PSS has different potentialities depending on the space where it's going to implement it. And this, uh, um, it's very important to integrate a different uh, types of stakeholders to understand what are these potentialities of the PSS. So for example, we may have a PSS that is looking to uh, provide uh, like local networks for energy efficiency and this energy efficiency in a territory might be linked to uh, enabling the elderly to continue living at home in another territory. It might be dealing with uh, fuel poverty and long-term income for citizens. So in order to understand how is, is the PSS going to be um, potentially um, implemented in a certain space, we need to link it to the local sustainability challenges of territories. And um, in this network- Stefania, are factors, you doing well? Just so you know, you have four minutes left. Don't okay. get stressed, take it easy. Uh, yeah. We are all following, okay? Thank you. So um, this network of factors that it's implementing the PSS, it's gonna be creating these relationships uh, not only by the resource complementarity, but also because of the different proximities that is between them. So the different organizational and geographical proximities. And uh, this 
actor network it's uh, takes a, an extended approach so we're not only focusing in value chain actors but we have um, local authorities we have citizens we have uh, industrial chambers that are really contributing into the development of uh, an understanding what is the potentiality of the PSS in territory and the value creation activities are going to be embedded, uh, are affected by the embeddedness of the relationships between the actors. So in order to understand how companies and uh, networks and territories benefit from PSS, we use a notion of capitals and um, in the three different uh, scales in order to focus also in what are the material benefits of the solutions. So for concluding, a uh, territorial approach is relevant for shortening the value creation cycles from uh, material resources, but also for immaterial resources. And they allow companies to match their offerings with local sustainability challenges. The actor relationships uh, require to be understood outside from a pure market perspective because they are driven by social and cultural factors. And for evaluating the overall benefits of product service systems, we need to incorporate more actively uh, the immaterial values that they're creating. And territorial PSS projects are important for enhancing the collective uh, capabilities of actors to innovate and respond to locally constructed sustainability issues. So uh, for the reflections that we were giving, uh, the first one is uh, what is the role of product service systems in a circular society and how they can contribute to globally achieving the sustainable development goals. I think, uh, yeah, as obviously product service systems are a path towards more sustainable um, modes of uh, consumption and production, but they are also key to link this um, to link the production and the consumption with other local um, sustainability issues of territories. And uh, we can also see that maybe a PSS is, is not as an outcome of a network, but it is more an, a space for creating collective capabilities. And it's also about uh, how PSS can help to enhance the innovation and the resilience of territories. And what is politically necessary for a systemic transformation to a circular economy? I think uh, the first step is like to put institutions and politics at the center of the narrative of transition. Like from a design discipline, I think my um, reflection is that we do not really talk about the politics of our actions and how it impacts the system. Another important thing is to to really bring into the narrative the the, the social justice and how can we empower marginalized actors and more importantly it's like how can we facilitate public spaces in order to, to co-create this um, innovation and functional but also territorialized in the meaning that they are corresponding to the realities of the different locals of futures so i think i was like in the 10 minutes <laughs> In the 10 minutes uh, slots. Almost, Estefania. Well done. <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much. Here is uh, my contact. Um, I think I'm missing my email, but, um, but yeah, thank you oh. very much. I will take hopefully no more than five minutes for quickly introducing three things which I should know or which you should know about the SDGs and circularity. Uh, this is coming from my own research. I wrote a thesis on a pathways towards circularity and the very link in between the SDGs and circularity. And I will just move ahead with my presentation quickly, okay? So SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, you might all have heard about it. I don't know your level of knowledge. Uh, I still keep learning about them. Uh, here they are. This is probably what almost everyone knows. There are 17 of them. And uh, yeah, 
they are diverse from no poverty up until uh, SDG 17. I uh, know two people who uh, both say we need 18 or 19 or more SDGs, but what we have is 17 and here they are. I've put together three facts which I think you should know about uh, the SDGs and circularity. Uh, so here they are. Um, you can read this. Uh, you might know that the 17 SDGs are more than just 17 SDGs. They actually have 169 targets. Uh, they were signed, they were co-developed, and they were signed by 193 UN member countries back in 2015. But this is five years from now. And they are universal, so they apply to all countries in a very similar manner uh, across the world. And they are planned to be achieved by... 2030, but some of them actually already by 2020, which was last year, those were mainly biodiversity related uh, SDGs. Most of them were not achieved. Uh, the SDGs are part of the agenda 2030, and you have seen a move, or we have seen a move away from three Ps to five Ps, uh, which are people, planet, pro prosperity, peace, and partnership. That's the first thing. Now, where is secularity in the SDGs. Well, you will be surprised, but the or, or not, uh, but the word circular is not one of the 14,798 words. So almost 15,000 words, uh, which are describing uh, Agenda 2030, uh, including the preamble and all of the SDGs. The word circular is not there. Um, that also means the words circular economy or circular society are not part of those SDGs which were signed by 193 governments five years ago. Uh, since we're in a kind of German context, I also looked up the Germany's last sustainable development strategy, the official uh, strategy from the German government. And well, same thing here, the word circular does not appear in that strategy which is back from 2017. Um, I'm wondering about two questions, whether or not the UN will start considering circularity more for achieving the SDGs and whether the current circular economy jet strategy in the making for Germany will actually refer to the SDGs uh, because fact number three is there's a lot of hope. Um, I'm just giving you three examples. Uh, I realize I made a little mistake here. So the World Benchmarking Alliance is obviously the Benchmarking Alliance and not the Benchmarking Alliance. Uh, so Chatham House, Jeffrey Sachs and colleagues and the World Benchmarking Alliance all do great research on circular policies and practices related to the SDGs. All three of them find that there are the very strong relationships and kind of prove that there's obviously a lot of potential in circular policies and practices towards achieving uh, the SDGs by 2030. Um, my own kind of monitoring also shows that in, in the space of the circular economy, players and proponents, we see a lot of talk about 2050 already, uh, which is kind of obvious because we all know and we're probably all aware that the transition uh, is not a quick and easy thing. This may take a while, uh, several decades or so, while uh, I'm actually trying to claim that 20, the SDGs are already there and 903 government, 93 governments have decided to try to achieve them by 2030, so we have 10 years to go. I'll just give you a few examples of what those different players, the three I mentioned, and there are more. So Jeffrey Sachs and others, World Benchmarking Alliance and Chapter House came up with in terms of identifying interlinkages between circularity and um, the SDGs. First one is uh, the six transformations developed by Jeffrey Sachs and his colleagues, where uh, you have two kind of main principles, which you see on top and on bottom of, of uh, this picture. First one is leave no one behind. And second one, surprise, surprise, is circularity and decoupling. So in those six systems transformations, which they describe, 
you have two main principles, one of which is circularity and de decoupling. Number two is, as I said, World Benchmarking Alliance. Very interesting work on the circular transformation in different industries. They identified seven industries with a enormous potential or with the biggest potential for the circular transformation. And you can see this here, and I put their report yesterday in the chat of, of our session. Um, so this is just to kind of give you an idea of, of what several organizations are already doing. Last but not least, uh, Patrick Schroeder at the Chatham House is doing very interesting research on uh, those uh, linkages, finding uh, a lot of um, interdependencies and uh, an enormous potential for uh, circular practices, policies, circular thinking for achieving all of the uh, SDGs. Uh, this is, you find this in, in certain publications published by uh, Chatham House. Now, while science and businesses uh, do different kinds of research and identify different kinds of overlaps uh, or different kinds of, of interlinkages, they also overlap. And where they overlap is uh, SDG 6, SDG 7, SDG 8, 12, and 15. There's a less strong overlap in OSDG 13. Uh, I will leave it with that. Uh, this is us. This is myself. Uh, we also do three things, constructive journalism, science communication, and knowledge brokerage. And uh, so I just wanted to use this very briefly to give you kind of an idea of the strong interlinkages uh, between circularity and the SDGs uh, in the absence, if you will, of a official, proper official recognition of, of those two. Um,